All right, so although this video is gonna be sort of about the extreme overclocking stuff that I'm doing that you guys are becoming extremely burned out on, but I think this is interesting. I, I think there's a lot you guys can learn. And what we're gonna do today is gonna kind of tie into not just the extreme overclocking stuff that we're doing, but this is gonna be true for air coolers, water coolers, water blocks, AIOs. We're gonna talk about lapping. We talked about lapping CPUs in the past. We've showed you the benefit of lapping them because the IHS isn't always flat. In this particular instance, because the GPU die itself is fully exposed, we're not gonna be lapping the die, but what we're gonna be trying to fix here is this terrible mount that I'm dealing with, very bad mount right here. I just put it on temporarily. But you can kind of see there's a contact patch there. And that's our clue right now as to what's really holding me back from getting any higher scores. Because the higher the clocks go, the more consistent and the more perfect the mount has to be. So today we're gonna take you along for a lapping ride and you can apply these results to your water blocks and air coolers and such. So this is the contact patch that we're looking at right here. And although this is not as bad as it normally is when I LN2 overclock, I only put the, block, uh, the pot on here for a second to check for, for booting and make sure everything works and such. Um, Cause I have to do this every single time to make sure if, if I shut down and I stop overclocking for the day because I think water got somewhere, I've got to do another test to make sure everything's good to go before um, I really start to move on and, and try and overclock farther. But you can see the contact patch, the thinner area, which in this case is right in the center, we want that to extend all the way to the edges. Cause what happens here is even though we're dealing with extreme cold, if we have cold spots and hot spots on the die. If we've got die to differential of like 20, 30 C, then we're never gonna get our high scores because we need the temperature to be consistent across the die. Now we're dealing with copper here, and this is very true for most air coolers and water blocks, AIOs. Copper is very soft, it's very malleable. Now one of the things that I'll do is I'm starting here with a very rough grit. This is like a 320 grit right here, way rougher than I would normally do. And it's also gonna be hard to get this one perfectly flat because of the amount of weight that's hanging off to the side right here. But if you were gonna be lapping like your water block, then at least you'd be able to like easily hold it by the block, get center, because you wanna make sure that, the, that you're not applying crooked pressure to it, otherwise you could be lapping it crooked. You want it to be as flat as possible. We're also using a piece of tempered glass because glass is perfectly flat. So I have just taken gaffer's tape, you can use duct tape or painter's tape even. I tape down the piece of sandpaper, starting with my roughest grit, and all I'll do is get as much pressure right in the center as I can. Not a lot, you don't wanna push hard. The, in this particular instance, the pot is really heavy. Its own weight is gonna be fine. But if you're using a water block or an air cooler, um, you're gonna to wanna to try and keep it just nice, gentle pressure. And I'm basically gonna just make a few passes and it's dry right now. I will normally put water on here and I will move on to that. And what I'm doing here is I'm looking for a pattern. Now, the cross hatching on here is really, really thick. Like, we'll, we'll, we will be stepping to a, a softer grit or a higher grit. That way we don't end up creating an issue here where we're making it too groovy, if you will. Some groove is okay. You want the thermal paste to be able to kind of bite in there. But just a couple of passes allowed me to see, it's gonna be hard to pick up on camera. I do have a little bit of a dome effect going here. Now look. It's not something you're gonna see with the naked eye. It's not something you're probably even gonna see necessarily with a T-square or a straight edge because we're talking about a very short distance here. But if we are just microns off at the temperatures that we're working with, at the pressures that we're working with in terms of this being mounted against the die, that alone can be enough to cause us a problem. But what I'm looking for each time I make a pass is that the crosshatch we wanna make sure that it goes from edge to edge, edge to edge, and you wanna change directions. Go 45 degree angles, go 90 degree angles, turn it 90 degrees, because you, don't, you wanna make sure that any pattern that's forming, whether it be on the outside, because it's raised on the edges, or in the middle, because it's raised in the center, you wanna make sure that it's nice and smooth all the way to the edge. So I'm gonna go ahead and do a couple more passes on here with the high grit. Because copper is such a soft material, starting with the high grit allows me to really bring down the height quickly, without wasting a lot of time. And if you look in the sandpaper, you can see we're leaving copper material behind. We are clearly taking copper off of here, which is what we want to do. We want to just shave it until it is perfectly flat. And the nice thing about this being a pot, I should have taped the glass down, but whatever, is the fact that it's so heavy, its own weight is all I need to get this done. Now actually, instead of going back and forth, I'll just pull it, because I think that's easier to maintain even pressure. 
I'll do a couple 45 degree passes now to compare. You can see that they are making it all the way to the edge. It looks like it's a little shinier on this side, so I might not have been super flat with it. So I'm gonna try it again. So now that I feel like I've gotten that level, I'm going to go ahead and pull up this paper and I'm gonna hang on to it because this paper has a lot of life in it. I haven't even used any wet sanding on this and that'll basically, the wet sanding will clear all of the pores of the sandpaper out or the grit and it will allow me to keep it clean and keep going. So we'll save this and we'll move on to like 800. Now I'm gonna go ahead and wet it and I'm just gonna do the same thing with the higher grit, which should actually be a lot easier to actually sand now because it's not as porous or gritty. I guess grit would be the right term, huh? Now this is a really rough look to it. Um, actually, depending on the angle you look at it, it has a little bit of a shine to it. I'm not going for a mirror finish here. And I think that's where a lot of people make their mistake is they try and go for like a polished look, like a full on mirrored, you know, you can see yourself. That's not what you want. I, I'm using Kingpin's advice of letting it stay slightly rough because it actually allows the thermal paste to have something to sort of bite to. You can see the scratch marks in here, but you can't really feel them with your fingers, but the scratch marks still being in there tell me that it's gonna have some texture for the thermal paste to sort of stick to. Um, trying to think of a good example of, so I guess it's kind of like, um, trying to paint something that's polished, right? The paint's not gonna really stick to it, it has nothing to bite to. The same thing goes for the thermal paste. If you think of the roughness or the rough texture of it being sort of like the, uh, the primer, if you will. Now there's a couple other things we have to try here because my other issue, well I just ripped that paper, that one's done. The other issue here is not just the flatness of the mount, but the even pressure of the mount. And I'm having such a hard time using that little retaining bracket that came with the air-cooled cards I don't think it's giving me enough pressure. Um, it's probably plenty of pressure for the air cooler, especially when you're not dealing with the extreme temperatures like we are and the extreme core clocks like we are. I'm trying to get this thing up to 26, 2640 and up. I've achieved it once. My previous best score was with 2640, but then my next best score was actually with 2625. I've not been able to get 2600 to run since. And I, I'm 100% positive it has everything to do with my poor mount here. Uh, by poor mount, I mean, oh, my poor mount. I mean, no, that mount's poor. Look, do it better. So I gotta re-insulate this guy. This is all the part of the adhesive and insulation that's still stuck to it, which is still perfectly fine. All we wanna do is keep air from touching the metal so that it doesn't frost up really bad. It's, it, it's good to tear it down like this because water can get trapped in here and then that can freeze. And then when you do your warm up runs to try and cure the paste or uh, heal the paste, it can run and freeze up the socket. We've had ice form in the sockets before. You guys have seen it. Um, it's also good just to get the screws nice and tight again because as the temperature goes extreme cold and then relative to the extreme cold back to room temp, which is extremely hot versus the extreme cold, the constant uh, fluctuation in temperatures will make the metal expand and contract, expand and contract, and then the, the screws can get loose and then it's impossible to get an even mount. So I'm gonna go ahead and remount this up with the bracket, get it all nice and clean, get my thermal paste cleaned out in here, get my probe back in there and just basically a full reset on this. One of the things I was doing too is I had foam around that. And we're wondering now if that foam, even though I had it, like it would squish down, if maybe it was causing it to not get a great contact either. I've done a lot of these videos now and I've explained the Vaseline a few times but I still get questions that are like, why are you Vaselining up the card? This just is water protection. I mean, the card freezes. All these components right here will freeze with a long enough benching session. And I'm trying to get to the point to where that doesn't happen because I'm getting my my numbers more squared out, squared away, and I can get right to the max numbers right away. But this actually creates a barrier. Um, and yes, the PCB is coated with a with a anti-moisture slash barrier already, but this is just extra protection. It does clean off really easy. Um, so it's just extra insurance, if you will. But I have to make sure I get it cleaned off from around the die right here too, because if I get Vaseline on the die, that's clearly not gonna work. Once you start pouring the LN2 in that pot and you bring it down below zero, a timer starts. And that's the timer of which you have to make something happen before the card gets too cold, the memory chips freeze, water forms everywhere, and then you just end up running out of time. So I've got these brackets mounted back up, nice and torqued back down, um, nice and even, make sure everything's nice and straight, nice and flush, and there's no, insulation material between the bracket and that so I can get that nice and square. I'm not gonna be using this guy. I don't think this is working very well. So instead I will be using the C-clamp like we did a few runs back a few videos ago. This is gonna be the first time I'm gonna be using the C-clamp since lapping it and making these changes to try and keep the bow 
from happening. What do, I mean, what do I mean by the bow? You see how far away the screw holes are? And this is true again for water blocks and stuff that you install on CPUs. This is why most of them will bottom out on the threads and not let you go so uh, certain, um, well, they only let you go so far. The manufacturers will typically find where that appropriate stopping point is so you don't crush the CPU IHS or hurt anything on the board. But because these are just threaded and you have to do it all manually, the holes are really far apart versus the die. So what happens is as you tighten it, the board will, will bow like that. As it bows, it will pull the die, the center of the die away from this. So the reason why you want the retention bracket in the back or something is to keep it flat. So one of the things that we're gonna be doing is seeing if we can't come up with some sort of a bracket for the back of this to keep it nice and square. Because again, the ultimate challenge here is to get the mount perfect. Finding the right frequencies, finding the right voltages, the right PWM frequency and all the, you know, all the different sub voltages that exist in this. There's more than just core voltage. There's, there's like three different voltages you actually play with, uh, four different voltages you can actually play with on this. Getting all of that right is only half the story. And the thing is trying to get that right when you're not exactly sure why you're crashing is also um, has everything to do with the mount. Did you crash because the mount was poor? Did you crash because of the fact that the uh, card was too hot? because the mount was poor? Was it not enough voltage? Was it too much voltage? What was the load line? There's so many things that you have to deal with. And I'm showing you guys the, the paste application process too, because when you're doing LN2, you actually want a lot of paste on there. I think Vince was asked once, like, how much paste do you use? And he was like, man, I just glob that stuff out of it. But we do spread it to get it nice and even from edge to edge. That looks pretty good to me. Here goes our first mount and our first attempt of the day. Holy stuff. <laughs> first run broke 18,000. We're done. No, we're not done. Hell no, we ain't done. Okay, save before the computer crashes. 18016. It's a valid result. Oh my God. I feel like the lapping worked. I feel like the clamp is working. The temperature was really easy to maintain. To, like, to maintain where, oh my God, I'm so excited right now. Do you guys have any idea how many, what, 150 or more runs, right, Nick? That we've, to try and be, oh. we're not done. I've saved that score. We need to stop letting it sit here being cold. That was 26, 25. I feel like we were able to get a really good score out of that simply because of the fact that I was able to keep the temperature consistent. There was no weird flickering. And I think the mount is actually doing its job now. So here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna go 26, 40 now. Same voltage and stuff, not changing anything. And we are just going to go for it. My wife is calling, I'll call you back, I love you. The fact that the very first run of the day, and here's the thing, I was debating trying 2640, and Nick was like, you should go for 2640, Vince would tell you go for 2640, and I was like, no, I'm gonna go for 2625. But the thing is, my previous 2625 and 2640 runs were really glitchy. Like Nick has seen like black flashes on the screen, not like artifacts, like the whole screen would flash black. And that was killing my score because of the fact that every time that happens is a drop frames and they don't get counted. And remember this, the score is based on how many frames it can draw in the time allotted. And if I'm not flickering and causing weird issues because I have hot spots on the die by having an extremely uneven mount, which right now I think we actually have a pretty good mount, we're now warmed up back to the 50s, so I'll start pouring LN2, bring the temps back down, and then we'll get 26.40 a go. Here, let's get Phil's reaction. Phil! 18,000? Why, did you hear me say it? Yeah. How, yeah, I was saying, I've, I've done over 150 runs, maybe even closer to 200, because there's who knows how many I didn't log. Hey, look, it's got the green check mark. I didn't get screwed again. So one of the downsides about having the C-clamp on here is I'm too tempted to be like, let me just go a little tighter. And then I think I just wrecked the mount because it was crashing at the start. And I was like, well, let me get a little more pressure on it. And then now when I apply the voltage or try to apply the clock, it just instantly crashes. So I think the mount might be too tight, which is fine. I can break it down. Warm it up, do it again, which I plan on doing a little bit more today. Um, it's still early. It's only 11 o'clock in the morning, but I have to go ahead and I have to go ahead and upload this score because even if between when I upload this and this goes live, which I, I'm going to try and put this live today. So you guys know, like this is today's video. If you guys are wondering, oh, what would Jay do today? This is today. Um, you guys will be able to see like I did in fact beat him to 18,000. So. Yeah, I know I'm still well behind Lumi and OGS and all those other guys that are insanely fast on their cards. But regardless, let's go ahead and do this together here. Look at that, I already put it up there. Sorry, Joe. Better luck next time. All right, so like I said, I want to end this video by taking, oh yeah, I see the bottom froze pretty good. The slot, the slot isn't frozen. 
There's a little bit of water in there. Not enough to really matter. That could have just dripped off right now, but um, got to dry all this out, blow all of it out. But I want to see the mount. And I'm, like I said, I was too tempted to, oh, did you hear that crunch? <laughs> I was too, it's, it's going to be really frozen back there. Oh yeah. I was really, really tempted at uh, turning the, the handle and I did. And I'm almost positive that that is what stopped that benchmarking session instead of just kind of letting it go. Whoa, that just slid right out of there. Cause I mean, like anything else, this gets cold too. And then you start dealing with the contraction, expansion and contraction of the metal, but not that much ice on the back. I'm actually kind of surprised. So like I said, there's a couple things that happened here. I removed that foam from around the, the, the main part of the pot that touches the die, which could have, for all we know, been causing it not to sit completely flush against the, uh, the die. We lapped the die or the, no, we didn't lap the die. Too scared to do that. We lapped the pot and then we added the C clamp. And I'm keeping pressure right on the center here cause I don't want it to rotate and tilt cause that will affect the way that it looks. Cause I really want to inspect this mount cause this is very, very important. Okay, well, a lot of it globbed out around the side. We can see the die right here. It still wasn't perfect. You can tell right there, it's not centered. We still had improvement to make, and that's why we can't hit 2640. So that's where we're gonna end today's video. You guys can keep your eye on the leaderboards to see if Joe responds. Joe Stepanzi, AKA Bearded Hardware. Huge thanks to EVJ, of course, for constantly supporting me with the hardware and stuff. They truly have been sponsoring these uh, overclocks for me. Wow, look at the amount of ice that formed here. This is part of the problem, right? I was worried about this. I think um, shorter benchmark sessions and then ice control is gonna be the way, the way of the future for me. So thanks for watching guys. And as always, we'll see you in the next one.